Twelve Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Frontiers of Texas by Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Twelve Years in the Saddle, Chapters 43 to 50. Chapter 43, The San Saba Mob. In 1896, I was ordered by Governor Culberson to go to San Saba and put down the mob that had existed there for 16 years. Governor Culberson sent me because he knew I was well posted with this mob, for I had been sent there in 1890, as stated in a preceding chapter, to preserve order while court was going on. I had also been a witness in the Campbell case ever since then, and was familiar with all the leading people on both sides of the wrangle. By this time, the situation had reached a very perplexing stage in San Saba. The men of both factions were very bitter and aggressive. Good and bad citizens, both, were on either side. In their continued strife, both factions had lost sight of the lofty ideals which had probably at first actuated them, and now allowed their animal passions to overcome them. The mob people had originally organized to put down lawlessness, while the anti-mobbists had organized to oppose mobbism because they thought the law should be allowed to take its own course. But those first principles had long been forgotten. Lawless people had joined both factions and had introduced their evil influences among members of each side. When the mob was first organized, it started out by preventing crime, especially stealing, but now lawlessness was being encouraged by both sides and could not be suppressed by local authorities. The bitterness between the two factions had become so great that a number of murders occurred and were traced to one or the other side. The state finally had to step in and put down the strife by suppressing the mob, as that was the side which was arrayed against the law. Cattle thieves, murderers, and other criminals were also given prompt attention, irrespective of the faction to which they belonged. When we went to San Saba, I took Dud Barker from Company B, and Captain J. H. Rogers sent me two men from his company, Edgar T. Neal and Alan Maddox. Barker and I were joined by the two other rangers, Neal and Maddox, when we reached Goldthwaite. Sheriff Hudson of San Saba also met us at Goldthwaite with a wagon and team. The three rangers under me went to San Saba in the wagon, and Sheriff Hudson took me over in his buggy. The county furnished me with a wagon, harness, and a span of mules, and the state furnished me a cook. We spent three days in the town of San Saba, and then left for Hannah's Crossing on the Colorado River. That was a beautiful place to camp, and that part of the river was one of the finest fishing spots in the world. We remained there four months, and enjoyed our stay, except for the danger we were in when we first arrived there. The people of both factions, especially the mob element, were antagonistic to us when we first went to San Saba and our lives were in danger. When we four boys pitched our tent at Hannah's Crossing, we shook hands with each other and made a solemn pledge that we would stay there and do our duty if we all had to die together. We vowed that we would arrest anybody of either faction whom we caught disobeying the law, and that we would die working the lever of our guns before we would give up our prisoners, no matter how many men we had to fight. When we pitched our camp, we expected that we would never have to move it again, for it seemed to me that we were doomed to die at the hands of some of the people of the bad element who were indignant at our coming to San Saba. We went about our work quietly, however, and made friends with everybody we could, and showed them that we were not after anybody but those who maliciously violated the law. The better class of people soon began to treat us kindly, and we were often invited to take dinner with them. We always accepted their invitations, and would eat one day with a member of the mob, and the next day we would probably dine with someone of the anti-mob faction. We showed no partiality to either side, and in that way we gained the respect of the law-abiding citizens of both factions, and our stay in San Saba was, for the most part, quite pleasant. With the tough characters, however, we had some rough times, and I met with quite a number of thrilling experiences, some of which I shall relate in following chapters. Hannah's Crossing was twenty miles from San Saba on the San Saba and Brownwood Railroad. When we went out to it, we were accompanied by Sheriff Hudson, who stayed at our camp a day or two before he went back to town. We located in Jim Lindsay's pasture, which was near the river. A week before we pitched camp, three men concealed themselves in this pasture one day and assassinated Bill James, a well-known citizen, while the latter was going after water in his wagon. 
We tried to capture the assassins, but they had a weak start on us, so we gave up, as we had lots of other work to do, and left it to the county officials to ferret out the perpetrators of the James murder. During the trouble between the two factions in San Saba, a Mr. Turner, an anti-mobist, was killed, and it was alleged that he was murdered by Matt Ford and Toby Bridge, two members of the mob. The trial, which took place at Austin, was sensational and created statewide interest. Ford and Bridge were defended by Governor Hogg, Judge James Robertson, and Judge Pendexter of Austin, and attorneys John and Ab Walters, brothers of San Saba. They were as good lawyers as the state afforded. Judge Albert Burleson and W.C. Linden were the prosecuting attorneys. There were 369 witnesses. Judge Morris was the district judge. The two men were at last acquitted and went back home to live, and they led a different life and made good citizens. The two factions in San Saba finally made peace with each other and buried the hatchet. The last time I was with them, they were going to church and visiting each other, and all signs of former strife and bad feeling had faded away. Chapter 44. A Bad Dog. I was summoned from San Saba, where I was at work putting down a mob, to Wellington, Collinsworth County, to appear against some cattle thieves. While in Wellington, I was presented with a large dog, which weighed a hundred and ten or fifteen pounds. He was a hound, and looked to be very ferocious. I thought it would be a good idea to take him to San Saba, pass him off as a fine bloodhound, and get the people afraid of him, as that would help me to put down some of the lawlessness that reigned there. When I went to Fort Worth, I bought a fine collar and two chains for him. I named my dog Bill. I expressed him to Lomeda, where he and I were to take the stage to San Seba. I put both chains on Bill to make people think he was very hard to hold. When we arrived at Lomeda, I chained the dog to the stage. He reared and surged against the chains furiously, and acted like he would tear the earth up if he could get loose, but it was all nothing but pretensions, for the dog really was no account for anything. When he reared around, growled, showed his teeth, and tried to break the chains, he looked as dangerous as a lion and I was glad of it, for I wanted him to fool the people, and make them think I had a dog that would tear them up if he was sent after them when they committed a crime. He reminded me of a man who seems anxious to get into a fight, although deathly afraid of the other fellow. The stage driver was afraid of Bill, and would not go near him. That night at ten o'clock, an old nester from the woods walked up to the stage to get a jug of syrup that he had sent for that morning. When Bill got sent to the old man and his two dogs, he at once got on the warpath and charged around like a lion. The stage driver said to the man, Please do not come any nearer. Sullivan has his bloodhound on the stage, and he is about to turn everything over now. If he should break loose, he might kill you and your dogs too. I will set your jug of syrup down, and when I drive away, you can get it. This break of Bill's gave him a big reputation as a ferocious bloodhound to start off with. The stage driver asked me to give him Bill's record, and he also wanted to know where I got such a fine dog. I did not inform the stage driver that Bill was a worthless dog, that he had been raised on the streets of Wellington, but I told him he had been given to me by a friend of mine who lived in New York. I told him that Bill had done wonderful work for the officials at Sing Sing in running down the most noted criminals in the United States. The people in the stage gasped at that, and I told them that I would use Bill on the criminals in San Saba. I felt it my duty to tell the people these tales about this dog, for the odds were against me in San Saba, and my life would not be in so much danger if the people were afraid of Bill. Besides that, some people might refrain from committing crime for fear this dog would catch them, and either hurt them or bring them to justice. I reached San Saba about twelve o'clock that night and put up at the hotel. By the next morning, the news had spread all over the country about me bringing Bill with me, and people flocked in from every direction to see Bill. They asked me all kinds of questions about him, and time and again I told them his whole wonderful history. They asked me to let him chase somebody, but I told them that he was in San Saba for straight business, and not for foolishness. At the proper time, I said, he will show his blood, but the main reason why I don't let him chase someone for fun is that he might kill somebody, and I do not want to be responsible for anything like that. They thought that was a good reason, and they were more afraid of him than ever. I was detained so long by the people who wanted to see Bill that I didn't reach my camp until that afternoon. I kept my dog with me at Hannah's Crossing, and all the people all up and down the river came to my camp to see him. I kept his fine collar on him, and he looked very vicious as he reared against the two chains and snapped and snarled at the visitors and showed his big, sharp teeth. 
I cautioned the people not to get too close to him, telling him that he was not a play dog. I also told them not to look too hard at him, for fear he would break the chains and tear somebody up before I could get him under control. The people minded me very well, and I never did have any trouble between them and the dog. Not a single murder occurred while I had Bill, and I had no occasion to use him, for which I was very thankful, as Bill would have proved an absolute failure had I ever unchained him and set him off after a criminal. Chapter 50 A Good Time Lost One Sunday morning, while we were camping at Hannah's Crossing, all four of us rangers, Edgar Neal, Alan Maddox, Doug Barker, and I, were invited across the river to participate in a hard-shell Baptist foot washing. We accepted the invitation and enjoyed the meeting very much. The members of the congregation asked us to stay with them for dinner, as they were to have a spread on the grounds, and they desired very much to have us eat with them. They were to introduce us boys to the young people, and we were intending to have a very sociable afternoon. We had told the people that we would eat with them, and had made arrangements to stay all day. But just as the doxology was being sung, our cook, whom we called Tom, came to the church in fool's haste, lit off his horse at the church door, and asked a man who was sitting on a back seat to get us rangers for him. We went out as soon as the man said that Tom wanted us. Tom informed us that there were two men at camp who desired very much to see us, and for us to go as quickly as possible. We made a break for our horses, jumped into our saddles, and made a three-mile run in a few minutes, believing all the time that when we reached camp we would hear that someone in the neighborhood had been killed. When we arrived at our destination, we found the two men waiting for us. One of them said he wanted to speak to me. He took me off where the others couldn't hear him, and in whispers told me that on the day before, while he was in the cotton patch, someone had entered his smokehouse and stolen twelve pounds of bacon. I told him at once that if it wasn't Sunday, I would hang him for causing us rangers to run our horses nearly to death, besides missing our dinner and a good time with the young people, just because he had twelve pounds of bacon stolen from him. We offered to go and see about the theft, however, and the next morning we got our horses and started over to his place, which was about nine miles from camp. Well, riding along the road, we got thirsty, so we stopped in at a house and got a drink of water. When we entered the yard, we saw two ladies in the hallway of the house sewing on a quilt. When we asked their permission to get a drink of water, one of the ladies politely told us to come in and help ourselves, which we did. After we had finished drinking, she seated us and said she thought she knew where we were going. Maybe you do, I said, in a manner that invited her to speak on and tell us what was on her mind. I think you are going to see about some bacon that was stolen last Saturday afternoon, she replied. Yes, we have started over that way, I said. I have no idea, she continued, that anyone stole that bacon. The smokehouse door was left open, and I think the dog went in and dragged a few pounds of meat out. The man married a mere child, and I suppose she left the door open herself when she went down to the field to see her husband. When the old lady got through talking, I spoke up and asked, Why didn't the crazy man marry a woman that was old enough and had sense enough to keep house for him? His wife is my daughter, she replied, and then the rangers had the laugh on me. Conversation between the old lady and me then ceased for a few minutes, and I thought of the good time I would have had Sunday, and the trouble I would have been saved, if those two men had not ridden nine miles to our camp, and made the cook ride three more miles, and summon all four of us rangers, and cause us to ride nine miles and back for nothing the next day, all because a dog had stolen ten or twelve pounds of bacon. As we expected, we found no bacon thief, and went back to camp feeling rather done up, and wishing to forget the incident as long as we lived. Chapter 46. Fording the River Soon after dark one evening, while we were camping at Hannah's Crossing, I received a message from the postmaster at Indian Creek in Brown County, saying that the post office at that place had been robbed. I was urged to go to the scene of the robbery at once, so we packed one of the mules and immediately started for Indian Creek. It was very dark, and rain was pouring down in torrents, but we went on anyway, and tried to find a place where we could ford the river, as we wanted to cross it before daylight. We went up the river about twelve miles, but still could find no place where we thought it was safe to cross. We feared that it was raining so hard further up the river that we couldn't cross any better up there than where we were, so we decided to stay at Bill Martin's house, which was nearby, until daylight. We went up to Mr. Martin's house and called him to the door. He asked me who we were. I told him that I was Sullivan and that I had the Texas Rangers with me. It was raining so hard that it was only with difficulty that we could hear each other talk. 
Martin invited us to spend the night in the house with him, but we told him we couldn't stop unless it was impossible for us to ford the river. We then asked him if he thought we could make it safely to the other side. In reply, he said that if it has rained above as it has here, the river is bound to be swimming, and that he would not advise us to cross the river tonight. He again invited us to spend the night in the house with him, but we were so wet that we decided it wouldn't do for us to go in and sleep in his beds and get them damp. So I asked Mr. Martin to let us sleep in his gin house, since we could not cross the river, and did not want to go in his house in our condition. He assured us that that would be perfectly agreeable to him, so we went into the gin, and each one of us dug a hole in the cotton and slept in it. The next morning, when we got up, we found that the heat of the cotton had nearly dried us. Mr. Martin and his wife fixed a good breakfast for us, and as long as I live I shall never forget that big dish of fried chicken and that pot of delicious coffee that they had prepared for us. After breakfast we went to the river to see if it was very high, and found that it was just about swimming. It looked silly for wise men to plunge into that river, but we four boys split it wide open, leading our pack mule, and crossed safely over to the other side. We reached Indian Creek that day, and captured the men who had robbed the post office. I sent them to Brownwood by Barker and Maddox, and they stood trial for the robbery, and beat the case. Edgar Neal and I remained in that community several days looking up testimony for the state. Chapter 47 Girls Try to Kiss Neal While looking up testimony in the country around Indian Creek, a few days after the post office robbery, Edgar Neal and I came to a house where a Mrs. Hogan, a widow, and her four daughters lived. It was about an hour and a half before sundown when we arrived at Mrs. Hogan's house. We had learned before reaching this place that the two men whom we had arrested had stopped there the night they committed the post office robbery. Mrs. Hogan said that they left her house that night at eleven o'clock. She also informed us that the two men lived directly east of her, and when they left the house the night of the robbery, they climbed over the fence and went due west, the direction of the post office. The evidence that we had accumulated that day, and the things Mrs. Hogan told us that evening, led us to believe that we had arrested the right parties. When we first went into her house and seated ourselves, Mrs. Hogan asked us if we were strangers in that part of the country. I replied that we were, and I told her my name. She gave me her name and treated me in a cordial manner. I saw at once that they were well-to-do, cultured people, and after introducing myself, I presented Mr. Neal to Mrs. Hogan. Mrs. Hogan, I said, allow me to introduce you to Mr. Neal. Is it Bedgar Neal? she asked. It is, Edgar answered. My dear nephew, she joyfully exclaimed, why didn't you let me know you when you first came in? I thought I recognized those eyes when you first stepped in at the door. She made a dive at Edgar and grabbed him by the hand. She looked like she was trying to kiss him, but he leaned his head out of her reach. Then she asked him how Dona and the baby were, and he replied that they were both well. You have fleshened up mightily, she said. He nodded. I was just about to tell the old lady that she was mistaken in this man, when she called out to her four daughters, who were in the next room, and said, Come in, girls. Cousin Bedgar is here. All four of them came hopping and skipping in at once, and they were as pretty as any girls I ever saw. I was wishing that they would make some mistake about me, but they didn't. Edgar got the benefit of it all. The lady introduced the girls to him, for fear he had forgotten some of their names. Then they began to hanging on him and trying to kiss him. He played the same game on them, however, that he played on the old lady. He ducked his head and leaned it over to one side. After they got through hugging each other, Edgar and the four girls sat down together in the middle of the room. One of the girls asked Edgar how Dona and the baby were. He replied that they were both well. You have fleshened up so we like to have not known you, another girl observed, when she had a chance to speak. Now, while all this was going on, my heart was beating like a mule kicking downhill. I was frightened. I knew if they discovered their mistake and found out this was not Cousin Bedgar, that they would make it hot for us, for the old lady had a game appearance, and also the four girls. So I kept asking questions about the robbers, for fear they would keep talking to Edgar and get him tangled up and learn that he was fooling them. Whenever they asked Edgar a difficult question, I broke into the conversation and asked some important question about the robbers, thus saving Edgar from answering their queries. Finally, it got to where I could stand it no longer, and I said, Ladies, we will have to be traveling, as we are on urgent business. The old lady and all four girls spoke up and said at once, Cousin Bedgar, you are not going to leave us now, are you? 
Holding on to his arms and coat, they continued, "'Cousin Bedger, you have not been here in so long. You cannot leave here tonight.' I spoke up and said, "'We are forced to go, ladies. We will return tomorrow evening and spend the night.' And Edgar said, "'Yes, we will. I see you have a piano, and we will sing and play.' The old lady said, "'My dear boy, you should not leave your aunt tonight.' We were both satisfied that we had spent about all the time we could spare at that place, so after telling the family goodbye, we quickly made for our horses. We laughed a great deal about the joke on Mrs. Hogan, and often wondered how we came out of it alive. We learned afterward that they enjoyed the joke very much, and when the girls first realized that their mother had caused them to be fooled, they took it good-naturedly, and in a spirit of fun, they pounded her considerably on the back. Edgar Neal enjoyed jokes immensely, and was a good-hearted man. He quit the ranger company at San Saba and became the sheriff of that county, making the people a splendid officer during the eight years that he served them. Chapter 48. The Capture of Wax Lee While I was stationed at San Saba, Tom Gray, a hardware man of that town, received a letter addressed to a man with his name. Upon opening it, he saw that it was written by someone in Paris and was meant for another Tom Gray. In this letter, the Paris man warned his friend in San Saba that the officers were still looking for him, and that he had gone to a mighty good place to get caught. The letter also revealed the fact that the man's real name was Wax Lee, and that Tom Gray was his alias. When Mr. Gray, the merchant, told me about the letter, I knew at once that the other Tom Gray was badly wanted somewhere, so I went to the post office and waited for someone to call for the letter. Late that evening, Mr. Jim Brooks, brother to Judge Brooks of Austin, came to the post office and called for the letter which was addressed to Tom Gray. I asked Mr. Brooks if he knew anyone by the name of Tom Gray. He replied that he had a man by that name working for him, and that Gray had a companion with him. Brooks lived about twelve miles out of town, so I got a buggy and went out to his place. Brooks went in the buggy with me, and I sent the three ranger boys out there on horseback. I hadn't recovered from the injuries, which I received while chasing Del Dean, and was not able to ride horseback. When we reached the farm, Brooks led us to an old house where the two men were camping. We could not get the buggy right up to the house, however, on account of a slough which emptied into the Colorado River and which lay between us and the house. This slough was so muddy and boggy that I could not get the buggy across, as I have stated before. So I sent the three other rangers over on their horses and told them to capture the man and be very careful in making the arrests. After the boys had gone, I discovered a tent about forty yards in front of me, and thinking that the man I wanted might possibly be in it, I got out of the buggy, and, leaving Brooks to hold the horses, I walked toward the tent to see what I could find. Brooks had told me that Lee was dark-complected, and when I had nearly reached the tent, a man of that description came to the door. I decided to arrest him, but, when I started toward him, Jim Brooks called out and told me that the boys had arrested the men, so I whirled around and went back to the buggy. When the rangers got back to the buggy, I saw that Brooks was mistaken, for the boys had captured only one man, and he was the companion of the one I was after. Brooks saw and heard the rangers when they made the arrest, but took it for granted that they had captured two men instead of one, and being thus mistaken, he informed me wrong. When I turned and walked away from the tent, Wax Lee, the man whom I started to arrest, broke and ran toward the river, crossed the slough, and hid in the brush, which was thick all along there. I saw the man running, and when the rangers turned their prisoner, a young fellow, over to me, I told them to go after the other man immediately. I mounted Brooks and sent him along with them, as I knew they would have a hard time finding the man if he hid in the brush, and they would need all the help they could get. As I was afraid he would do, the man hid in the brush, and the boys couldn't find him anywhere. After searching the brush a little while, they gave it up, and got together to plan what was the best move to make next. During the conference, Dud Barker discovered that while he was loping his horse a few minutes before that, his six-shooter had worked around too far behind him, and while talking to the other men, he reached around and pulled his gun in front of his belt to readjust it. None of the men knew that Wax Lee lay hidden within a few feet of them while they were wondering where he had gone to, and Lee could not understand what the men were saying, so when he saw them stop, he thought he had been discovered, but decided to lie still, thinking that he might be mistaken. When he saw Dud Barker pull his pistol in front on his belt, however, he thought that he had surely been discovered, and imagined that Barker was going to shoot him, so he called out and asked the rangers not to kill him. He then surrendered to the boys, who were very much surprised, since they had not seen him before he crawled out of the brush. 
The rangers fired their six-shooters to let me know that they had captured their man. When I heard the shots, however, I was afraid that they were having a battle with Lee, but pretty soon they brought him up, and we took the two prisoners to town. When the boys brought him up to the buggy, Lee told me that he was satisfied just as soon as he saw I was after him that I had his right name. He then told me that his name was Wax Lee, and that that was his son whom we captured with him. When we reached San Saba with the prisoners, we learned that Wax Lee and his son were wanted in Paris, Texas, and also in the Indian Territory. We wired the sheriff at Paris, telling him that we had his prisoners. The two men were charged with four murders and twenty thefts of horses and cattle. The sheriff at Paris gave us a hundred dollars for the capture. A big reward was out for the men in the Indian Territory, and we tried to get it, but some slick scoundrel beat us out of it. Chapter 49. The Cowboys' Reunion Judge Glasgow of Seymour notified me while I was in Austin in 1897 that I was elected Marshal of the Day over the Cowboys' Reunion, which was to be held in his town on the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th days of August. Later on, Judge Glasgow came to Austin, and I met him at the Avenue Hotel. I was then attending court, aiding in the trial of the famous Matt Ford and Toby Bridge murder case, which was removed from San Saba to Austin. Judge Glasgow asked me if I had received his letter, in which he had notified me that I was to be the marshal of the day at the Cowboys' reunion in August. I told him that I had received the letter, and he asked me if I wasn't going to serve them. I told him that I would be proud to do so, but that I would have to see MacDonald, my captain. "'Where is Bill?' he asked. "'There he is, just a few steps from you,' I answered. Glasgow walked up to MacDonald and told him that a committee had elected me to act as marshal of the day over the Cowboys' reunion at Seymour, and asked him if I could serve them. MacDonald replied that I could not go, as I would have too much work to do then putting down the mob which was raging in San Saba County. "'You are over Sullivan as captain,' Glasgow replied, "'but there are two men at the Capitol over you, and I shall go and see them.' Glasgow then walked up to the Capitol and was gone about a half hour. When he returned to the hotel, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, "'Charlie Culberson, the governor of our state, and W. H. Mabry, the adjutant general,' Both say that you shall act as marshal at the Cowboys reunion. I left for Seymour in time to arrive there by the night of the 2nd of August, and the following morning I was sworn in as marshal of the day. 20,000 white people and 500 Comanches were in Seymour for the reunion. Chief Canna Parker had charge of the Comanches. I served them four days and nights as an officer and never jailed a single person. The whole town was turned loose to the Cowboys and other visitors. There never was better behavior known in such a large crowd before. Thirty saloons were open day and night, and the cowboys drank some and had lots of fun, but they were as quiet as necessary and respected the law. On the night of the 5th, the Indians gave a great war dance on the reunion grounds that was quite an interesting sight to witness. I had to arrest a man for cutting the rope that was stretched around the arena in which the Indians danced, but his wife and mother and two young ladies who were with him all pled so earnestly in his behalf that I didn't lock him up but let him go free. Judge Glasgow, ex-sheriff Sam Suttlemeyer of Baylor County, Canna Parker and his favorite wife, and I had our photographs taken together. Canna stole this squaw from another Comanche, and his men got mad and deserted him, and he went to New Mexico, where they stayed several months. The Comanche, whose wife was stolen from him, finally wrote to the chief and told him if he would give him $1,100, he could keep her and could come back and take charge of his tribe. Canna at once paid the money, and again became the chief of the Comanches. I found Canna and his men to be easily controlled, and they gave me no trouble whatever. One night after the reunion had closed for the day, and while the people were on their way from the fairgrounds to the city, about 2,000 cowboys bunched up together and commenced firing their six-shooters off in the air. The guns gleamed in the moonlight, and it looked like the world was full of lightning bugs. Canna and several of his braves rushed up to me on their horses and asked me what the shooting meant. I told them that it was a lot of jolly cowboys having a little fun, but meaning no harm. Canna and his Comanches were on the reunion grounds, and I told Canna to call his men together and have them form themselves in a circle. They did as I had requested, and all got as close together as possible, and I held them that way until the cowboys had passed and ceased their shooting. There was no danger of the cowboys making any break at the Indians, but I thought I had better take that precaution. I witnessed, during that reunion, some of the finest roping and bronco-busting that I ever saw in my life. I have often wished, since then, that I could witness another reunion like this, and be the marshal of the day, and have things move off as they did at Seymour. Chapter 50. Hidden Witnesses 
When I left the ranger service, I accepted a deputy ship under Sheriff Pirrell of Williamson County. One day, while court was in session at Georgetown, Judge D. S. Chesser told me that he had received a phone message from Corn Hill, saying that four suspicious characters were camping about ten miles from that place, and that some officers should go out and investigate the party. The man who phoned Judge Chesser had been out in bee hunting, and when he walked near the camp, one of the four men motioned him not to come near them by waving a towel at him. The hunter became suspicious and phoned Judge Chesser. As all the officers were busy, Judge Chesser asked me to go out with him to round up the men and find out what they were doing in that pasture. I told him that I would go with him, and we left a little after dark, reaching Cornhill about eleven o'clock that night. A Mr. Johnson, the man who had sent for Judge Chesser, met us there, and, mounting his horse, went the rest of the way with us. About three miles from Corn Hill, Johnson said that he knew a man down in the cornfield who was very good and brave, and that it would be a good idea to take him along, as the place where the men were camped was surrounded by brush, and that they could easily escape if we didn't take another man along to help us. Though it looked rather funny to me, I consented to his getting this man from the cornfield, but our new assistant seemed very willing to join us, so I had no regrets about it. He carried a muzzle-loading shotgun, the lock, stock, and barrel of which were all three whitewashed. Traveling a mile further on, we came to another house, and Johnson expressed the wish that we get the man who lived there to join us, so we pressed him in too. About three miles further on, we stopped and got breakfast. We had lots of fried chicken to eat, and we did full justice to the occasion, as we had ridden all night and were dreadfully hungry. Referring to the gentleman who was entertaining us, Judge Chesser, while at the breakfast table, spoke up and said, We had better get this man to go along with us so I was now convinced that the judge was in favor of plenty of company. The other two men promptly said that they thought it was a good idea to get him to go along and help us, and I commenced wondering if all the men's feet were not getting cold. We pressed our kind friend into service and left immediately after breakfast, in order to arrive at the camp of the suspicious characters by daylight so we could find them asleep. We were riding fast, and the morning star was rising and shining brighter all the time. Nearing our destination, we came to another house where we found a man and his dogs in the cotton field, driving out a bunch of cattle that had broken into his field during the night. The man, his dogs, and his cows with their bells on were kicking up such a terrible racket that Judge Chesser decided that we had better press this man into service also, but we had a hard time getting him to the fence. When he finally reached us, however, we told him that we wanted him to help us arrest a bunch of outlaws who were camped nearly a mile from his place. He took a chill at once and said he was sick. He told us, though, that he had a hired man sleeping out in the yard on a cot, and that he thought he would go with us. We woke the man up and told him what we wanted, and he said he would go with us all right, and reaching under his pillow, he pulled out a twenty two caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. I asked him if that was the only gun he had, and he replied that it was. I handed him my forty five Colt revolver and loaned my other one to the man with the whitewashed gun, leaving me with my Bill Cook Winchester, which was a plenty for me. I felt perfectly safe with my trusty Winchester, for I knew it had never gone back on me. Arriving within two hundred yards of the four men's camp, we dismounted and tied our horses. We walked up a little trail, which carried us about a hundred and fifty yards nearer the camp. Then we stopped and commenced a discussion as to what we should do next. The morning star shone still brighter and brighter. We decided to lie still until daybreak. We heard a rooster crow in the camp, and I remarked that they must be movers. Just as day was peeping upon us, I told them to keep still, and I would make a sneak of about thirty steps toward their camp. I gave them instructions to come to me, one at a time, as soon as they saw me stop, and they did exactly as I had told them. I made another sneak, and they came to me again, as they had done before. That put us within ten or twelve steps of the camp. The chickens saw us, and not knowing what to make of us, they did some tall talking with each other, and I thought they would wake the men up before they got through. One man did rise up, and getting on his knees, he held his Winchester in his right hand and looked toward the west, but we had come from the east, and he failed to see us. I was in front of my men, and could see this man when he got up, but they couldn't, as they were scattered out behind live oak bushes, and I never spoke to them about the man handling his Winchester. It is about daylight, and we had better be getting up, said the man on the ground to the other men, but none of the sleepers responded to his call. In a few moments, the man who had spoken these words himself lay down on his stomach, and pretty soon had gone off into the sweet by and by. I motioned my men to follow me, and in another minute we had spread all over the camp. 
Two of the men were sleeping on the ground, and two in the wagon, but we captured all four of them with ease. We learned from them that they were witnesses in the Owens rape case, which was then being tried in Georgetown. When they told me that they were witnesses in that case, and that Colonel McCamson had them hidden out on the quiet, I asked Judge Chesser if they had any such names as these men gave as witnesses, and he replied that they did. I then turned them loose, and knowing that they were caught up with, they went to town that day and reported at the courthouse. Colonel Mackinson told me to let his witnesses alone after that. And chapters 43 to 50. Twelve Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Frontiers of Texas by Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twelve Years in the Saddle, Chapters 51 through 55. Chapter 51 The Hanging of Morrison. On the 25th of October, 1899, I was invited by Sheriff Williams of Wilbarger County to go to Vernon and help him hang a preacher who was sentenced to be executed on the 27th of that month for the alleged murder of his wife, whom he had poisoned with strychnine. I accepted the invitation and left at once for Vernon, arriving there on the morning of the 26th. The sheriff immediately put me on the death watch, and I remained on guard until 11 o'clock that night. The prisoner, Reverend G. E. Morrison, who was sentenced to be hung on the next day, was supposed to have murdered his wife at their home in Panhandle City and had been brought to Vernon for trial on a change of venue. Although given the death penalty, he denied his guilt to the last, but the evidence was conclusive and proved beyond doubt that he had fallen in love with another woman and had poisoned his wife to get rid of her. Though most people believed him to be guilty, there was a movement on foot to have Morrison's sentence commuted to a life term in the penitentiary. A few days before his execution, however, he and two of his fellow prisoners attempted to escape by attacking Mr. Shies, the jailer, and trying to overpower him. While one of the prisoners had Shies clinched, Morrison yelled to him to kill the jailer. This news reached Governor Sayers while Morrison's sister and two attorneys were kneeling at his feet, pleading with him to commute the prisoner's sentence to life imprisonment in the penitentiary. There was a possibility of Governor Sayers yielding to their prayer, but he determined upon the other course after he received the message from the sheriff and learned how ugly Morrison had acted. On the evening of the 26th, the sheriff at Vernon received a telegram from the governor saying that he must hang Morrison on the following day. Morrison listened to the sheriff as the latter read to him the governor's message and replied that all had been done that was possible and that he guessed he would have to take it. The next morning his sister went to the jail and wept over him. Later on, another lady and a preacher joined her, and the three knelt together in prayer. Morrison also prayed until time for the execution. At twelve o'clock, he stood on the scaffold and made his farewell speech. A few minutes later, his body dropped through the trap door, and his neck was broken. Morrison apparently took a fancy to me, and left me a pair of suspenders and a matchbox for keepsakes. He also wrote me a letter the night before his death, which I had requested him to do, as I wanted it for a souvenir. Following is the letter as he wrote it. Vernon, Texas, October 26, 1899. Mr. Sullivan, Dear Sir, You have asked me to write something that you can keep to remember the occasion of our meeting. I don't know what to say to you, but I hope the following may be entirely satisfactory. First, I believe in a future life, and I believe that men are punished for the sins of this life and are rewarded for the good things. Second, I believe in a general judgment, and all must stand in that day before the bar of God and be judged. I believe I have the witness of God's Spirit bearing witness with my own spirit, and believe that, though God allows man's law to take my life, yet he saves me, and of the future I have no fears whatever. Now, goodbye, and may you ever be a champion of the right and an enemy of the wrong. Your well-wisher, G. A. Morrison. Chapter 52 a prayer. During the first part of the summer of 1901, I was riding the range of the LX and Turkey Track Ranch on the Canadian River, guarding that place against a band of cow thieves and horse thieves and outlaws who were terrorizing the citizens in that part of the state. On the 8th of July, things having quieted down considerably on the range, I went over to a small ranch which I owned further up the river to take a little rest. 
During the afternoon of that day, while lying on the bed idly and quietly thinking over my past life, it suddenly came to my mind that in two more days I would be fifty years old, as the 10th of July would be the 50th anniversary of my birth. With that thought, I fell into deeper meditation. I asked myself if I had accomplished anything good in life, or if I had ever bettered myself, or had done anything to help mankind in general in my humble way. I smiled when I reflected that I had always been an honest, law-abiding citizen, so far as I knew how, and had ever tried to be a faithful officer. But another thought came to my mind, and I smiled no more. It is true, I had always been careful to do my duty to my state and to society, but had I not been very negligent of my duty to God? Once, in 1872, while attending a religious meeting in the little town of Douglasville, Texas, I was profoundly impressed with the doctrines of Christianity, as they were earnestly expounded by the able minister of that place. I did not feel, however, that I had been converted, and was leaving the church at the close of the services with no idea of becoming religious, when some of the preachers and a young lady, who was then Miss Cora Howe, stopped me and asked me to go up and give my life to God. I told him that I had not been converted, that I had not received God's grace. They talked to me a long time about my soul, and slapped me on the back so hard that I thought they were trying to beat religion into me. They finally left me and went their way, and I went mine. I still thought that I had not been converted, but a night or two after that, while riding back home after the close of one of the meetings which I had attended, and while deeply meditating on religious subjects, a happy feeling came over me that I cannot describe. Some young people were riding just in front of me, whose gaiety and laughter did not harmonize with the mood that had suddenly taken possession of my mind. So I held my horse back until the distance was so increased between them and me that I was left alone with God. Not in a church building, with men and women all around watching me, but there in that lonely spot, surrounded by nature, and with God my only witness, I beheld, even through the darkness of the night, a great light, and I reached out in an effort to grasp that brilliant, dazzling thing. I don't suppose I could have reached it myself, but because I tried so hard to get the light, it came to me, flooded my mind with spiritual understanding, and I gave my heart to my Maker. The rest of the story I do not like to confess. I lived as a good Christian would for three years, and then, as lots of men do, I began to be careless, and gradually grew more and more negligent of my duty to God, and for twenty-five years I left him almost entirely out of my life and consideration. In other respects, I had performed my duty and built up a good character, but I had not given God his due. And, as I lay on the bed on this July afternoon in 1901, these thoughts troubled my mind and pricked my conscience. I resolved that in two more days, on the fiftieth anniversary of my birth, I would again give my heart to God. In 1872, I had seen the light in the darkness. This time I beheld and recognized it in its peculiar beauty, even while the sun was pouring out his own rays of brilliancy all around me. I resolved to give God my heart on the 10th of July, and I had a good excuse for putting it off two days, for I desired, for sentimental reasons, to commence living right again exactly on the day of my 50th anniversary. It is not wise to unnecessarily put things off, and, in this instance, procrastination proved to be a great a thief as ever. On the 10th, the day I was to have reformed and to have given my life to God, I happened to be very busy, and failed to comply with the vow I had solemnly made on the 8th, and it was not long before I had good reason to regret it, for on the 12th, two days afterward, I met with an accident that came near costing me my life. I spent the day and night of the 11th in Dumas, the nearest town, where I had gone for my mail. On the following day, the 12th, I went back to the ranch, and in some manner accidentally shot myself through the leg, and came near bleeding to death before assistance reached me. While crawling on the ground, with blood spurting from an ugly wound, I thought of the resolution I had made four days before to lead a different life. Is this God's manner of punishing me for my negligence? I asked myself, but I did not believe it was, and dismissed the thought from my mind. I feared, however, that my time had come, and I dreaded to think that I was to die by my own hand. In my helplessness, I looked up to God and prayed to Him with all the earnestness of my heart. Oh, God, I know I do not deserve to live, but, merciful Father, grant me a few more years on this earth so that I can serve you the rest of the days of my life. If, however, it is your will that I die now, I shall accept my fate with resignation and calmness, realizing that thou art the all-wise God and know best what to do with me. God spared my life, and ever since then I have tried to live as I thought he would have me to do. 
Chapter 53. I Shoot Myself. During the twelve years that I served the people of Texas as a state ranger, I was exposed to hundreds of bullets and other dangers, but never received a serious injury until I shot myself while guarding the LX and Turkey Track Ranch in the summer of 1901, which fact I mentioned in the preceding chapter. After coming out of so many tight places unharmed, it seems remarkable to me that it should be left to my own hand to inflict the wound that crippled me for life. I returned on the twelfth day of July to my ranch, after spending the previous day and night in Dumas, and while passing through the pasture on my way to my ranch, my attention was attracted by the barking of a dog, the bawling of the cows, and the bleeding of calves. A certain dog in the neighborhood had a habit of chasing the cattle away from the water, and knowing this, I soon guessed the cause of the confusion, and decided to kill the troublesome little canine. When the dog saw me, however, he ran away going as fast as he could up the hill, with me close behind. I shot at him three times before he reached the top of a hill, and cocked my gun to have it ready for the fourth shot. Still after the dog, I was running my horse down the other side of a steep hill, when my saddle, which had been too loosely girded, slipped from the animal's back down to his neck. My horse, being a little wild, became frightened at this occurrence, and commenced to jump and pitch considerably. I was still in the saddle, and while trying to control the horse, I accidentally pulled the trigger of my six-shooter, which, as I have stated before, was cocked. Now, that was an unlucky moment for me when I touched that trigger and discharged that gun, and the next few hours meant horrible pain and suffering, while the following days and weeks were but little better. The bullet passed through my thigh, breaking the bone, and causing the blood to flow freely from the wound. I fell from the saddle to the ground, and saw my horse turn and run up the hill. When I discovered that I had broken my leg, I pulled my boot off and began crawling, dragging the boot along with me. My boots were of extra fine quality, and I did not want to lose them, so after going about seventy-five yards, I hid the boot in a place where I could easily find it afterwards. Owing to the nature of the wound, I had to crawl backwards. A few moments after hiding the boot, I fainted, and when I regained consciousness, my fever was so high and my mouth was so parched with thirst that I crawled to a nearby creek. The nearest house was two miles away, and, in trying to reach it, I crawled down this little stream. In quenching my awful thirst, I drank so much water that it cramped me. After four hours in the creek, I took to the land, and tried to shorten my journey by crawling through the pasture. Some distance away from the creek, I came upon a bunch of cattle. My leg was still bleeding, and the cattle, scenting the blood, came to me. I wished that they had been human beings. They did not know what to make of me, crawling along in such a strange manner, and becoming excited, they walked around and around me in a circle, gazing at me all the while. Suddenly a big Durham bull, with sharp horns, advanced near me, and looked as if he was going to tear me up. About five steps from me he stopped and shook his head, pawed the earth, and bellowed. I wished then that I had not lost my six-shooter when I fell from my horse a few hours before. I also remembered my Bill Cook Winchester, and thought about how quickly I would shoot this bull if I had it with me. As it was, I was defenseless and expected every moment that the next would be my last. I could do nothing but talk to the beast, and I appealed to his principle, honor, and mercy, and implored him not to attack me while I was so helpless. My prayer did not at first appear to have any effect on his mind and heart. While thus imploring the bull to go his way, I suddenly discovered that I had come upon a huge rattlesnake in his coil. I was within two feet of him when he began to use his rattles. I was satisfied from his movements that my time to die had at last arrived, and I felt rather creepish, but I managed to evade the snake by crawling around him, and thus ended my troubles of this nature. The bull and the snake gone, I resumed my slow and painful journey. I had to travel by throwing my body backward with my good leg. At sundown I reached a barbed wire fence, and was almost famished for water after my tedious crawl of an hour and a half across the pasture. Exhausted from loss of blood, I leaned my head against a post to rest. I soon became drowsy, however, and immediately roused myself to action, for I realized that to fall asleep then would mean death, as my leg continued to bleed and I was getting weaker all the while. Suddenly I heard the voice of a boy, and knew that someone was around. I was satisfied that it was Ray Bennett, the little son of the owner of the ranch, looking for his cows. I called out to him, but the wind was blowing toward me from his direction, and I could not make him hear. The noise that the lad made while riding in that part of the pasture gradually died away, and I knew that he was gone. The hope that had suddenly leapt into my heart also departed, and left me in despair. I was still suffering for water. 
I knew that there was an irrigation ditch about thirty yards on the other side of the fence, but getting to it was the problem. The fence was too low on the ground for me to crawl under, and climbing over it was, of course, out of the question. I thought of a place, however, about twenty yards further down, where the wind had blown the sand from under the fence and left a hole large enough for me to crawl under. I immediately made my way to that place and crawled through the hole. When I had got within fifteen yards of the ditch, I looked up and saw the same little boy whom I had heard a short time before. I called him to me and asked him to bring me my hat full of water from the ditch. He not only brought mine but his own full, and I drank all the water that my hat would hold. The boy then summoned his father, who brought me stimulants and carried me in a wagon to his house. This part of the trip was easy for me, as Mr. Bennett had thoughtfully put a mattress and some quilts in the wagon so I could rest more comfortably. I asked Mr. Bennett to send me to my ranch, six miles away, but he would not think of it, saying that it was too far and that the trip would make against me. He sent for his wife, who happened to be at the creek fishing, and they went to lots of trouble and did everything possible to help me. My wound had swollen so that my clothing had to be cut off the injured leg. A fire was quickly made, and a pot of coffee put on for me. Not wanting to occupy one of their best beds in my condition, I asked them to make a bed on the floor and let me lie there, but they would do nothing of the sort, and placed me in the best bed they had. I complained that I was too much trouble, but they assured me that I was not, and acted as if it were but a pleasure for them to do for me. Their manner and cordiality cheered me up and made me feel at home. Such is rural hospitality and kindliness. Mr. Bennett's oldest son, Charlie, went to a line camp nearby and got Charlie Smith, who lived there, to go thirty miles from the camp to a phone to summon Dr. Pearson at Amarillo, which place was twenty-five miles still further on. Dr. Pearson left Amarillo at two o'clock and reached me the next morning at eleven, about twenty-three hours after my accident. My leg was so badly swollen by that time that the doctor could do nothing but await developments. I stayed at Mr. Bennett's six days and was treated royally. I shall never forget the kindness of that family. On Wednesday, I was started in an ambulance to Amarillo, where I was to have my leg set. I was accompanied on my trip by five men who carefully attended to my wants. A dozen men wanted to go with me, but I told them that five would be enough. When we reached our destination, the next day at noon, my friends in Amarillo met me and rendered me what assistance and comfort they could. My leg had been broken so long that it could not be set straight. One end of the bone overlapped the other about three inches, which made a difficult operation for the surgeons. I had to stay in Amarillo three months, but the kind ministrations of friends seemed to shorten the time and ameliorate my suffering. My experience was terrible, but while undergoing it, I was forcibly reminded of the fact that there are many people in the world who have real humanity in their hearts, and who possess much tender sympathy for those about them who fall victims to trouble and misfortune. I was tendered financial assistance by the presidents of two banks of Amarillo, Messrs. W. H. Fuqua and Tall Ware, but, luckily, I did not need this assistance. Chapter 54. A Call for Protection In 1891, I was ranching in Moore County on the Canadian River. During that year, I went to Dalhart, Dallam County, to visit some friends who had settled there. To get to Dalhart, I had to go to Amarillo, which town was sixty miles from our ranch, and take the train there for Dalhart. Dalhart was then a new town on the Rock Island, where that road intersects the Fort Worth and Denver. It was strictly a railroad town, and was located thirty-five miles south of Tax Line, the county seat. The town and county were supposed to be prohibition, but two saloons and several gambling houses were running wide open in direct violation of the law. These saloons were called Tom Black and the Beckett, being named after their respective owners. The sheriff, who lived at Tax Line, had three deputies in Dalhart, but they were unable to put a stop to these violations of the law and could not preserve peace and order. When I reached Dalhart, things were in a bad shape, and a reign of terror existed. The town was filled with lawless people. Gambling was going on night and day, and drunkards were always to be seen staggering along the streets. A lady was not safe outside of her house. One lady was robbed in open daylight, and others were insulted by some of the low characters who daily emerged from the saloons, soaked with whiskey. While I was there on a visit, numbers of robberies occurred every night. The better element of the town were outnumbered by these outlaws, and were bluffed and scared by them. The lawlessness that reigned in Dalhart was becoming notorious, and the growth and the prosperity of the town was threatened. 
The people who were deeply concerned in the moral and material interests of the town realized that something had to be done with the outlaws and thugs who infested the city, and a committee of the best citizens of that place asked me to move to Dalhart and serve them as a peace officer. Justice of the Peace R. P. Edgell, Colonel Oakes, the banker, Chapman, the real estate man, and Sheriff Morris and Colonel Al Boyce were among those who asked me to help them break up the gang of outlaws who ruled their town. They offered me a hundred dollars a month for my services. I told them that it was a hard proposition to think about, as it was a bad bunch I would have to deal with, but I asked them for ten days' time to think over their offer. They gave me the time I asked for, so I left at once from my ranch to attend to other business and to think over their proposition. Before the time limit expired, I decided to go to Dalhart and help the people out, so I got on my horse and rode across the country, it being sixty-five miles away, and reached Dalhart late in the evening. The sheriff met me, and I told him to swear me in, which he did the next morning. I knew that I would have to go about my business in a determined manner. I also realized that, unless I was careful, I would have lots of trouble on my hands. I went to work at once and billed 27 cases against Tom Black for selling whiskey in a prohibition town and county, and 18 cases against Beckett for the same offense. I also billed cases against Beckett's bartender and Tom Black's three bartenders. Black then employed a lawyer, a Mr. Smith of New Mexico, to represent him. Smith went to Sheriff Morris and told him that Black said that he would give him, Morris, fifty dollars if he would discharge me. Smith then remarked that Black could get along all right with the sheriff, but he could not stand me, and again asked Morris if he would not discharge me for that fifty dollars. The sheriff told him by no means would he fire me, that I was the only man he had ever had who did not stand in with the tough element. The sheriff told me later on about the proposition that the lawyer had made to him, but told me not to mention it, and I promised him I would not. When I met Black afterward, however, I was sorry I had made the promise, for I saw I had to break it. Black was coming down the street, and I called to him and rode into an alley to meet him. I asked him if he had promised the sheriff fifty dollars if he would discharge me, and he answered that he had. I then asked him what his grievance was against me. He asked me if I did not summon the jury that indicted him in twenty-seven cases for selling whiskey. Of course, I did not have anything to do with summoning the grand jury, and Black ought to have known better than to ask such a question. I told him that I summoned every one of them, and asked him how he liked the men. He said that they were the liars and damn thieves of the country, and I told him that he was one of those jump backs himself. At that time I was pulling off my gloves. I was not going to shoot Black, I was going to throw down on him and make him listen to what I intended to say. Black thought that I was preparing to shoot him, as I afterward learned, so he made a spring and caught me around the waist, pinioning my arms to my side. After scuffling for quite a while, I finally succeeded in getting my arm loose from his, and reached down and clutched his throat. I touched White Man, my horse, with my left spur, and made him lean over toward Black. Black was jerking me all the time, and I still held to his throat. He finally twisted around until he got next to a porch, however, which gave him more power than I had while on my horse. My six-shooter had been working loosely on my belt, and his jerk in me made it slip around in front of me. He suddenly loosened his hold on one side with his right hand and jerked my pistol from the scabbard. Black was a giant in size, weighing 225 pounds and measuring 6 feet and 4 inches in height. I wondered for an instant what he was going to do with my six-shooter, but I soon saw, for after getting my gun he broke away from me and made a long run to his saloon, carrying the weapon with him. My Winchester was at the butcher shop on the opposite side of the street from where the struggle went on, and while Black was running to his saloon I popped the spurs to my horse, and he reached the butcher shop in about three jumps. I called to Bob Troop to hand me my Winchester, which he did. I knew there were no cartridges in it, as I had taken all of them out for fear some thoughtless person would throw the lever and put a cartridge in the barrel, and not knowing how to get it out, and would let it go off and kill someone out in the street. I asked Troop then to hand me my belt, and as he did so, I pulled two cartridges from it and loaded my rifle. I was just whirling my horse around to fire at Black, who was then entering the rear of his saloon, when I saw his half-brother running toward me with my six-shooter. I stopped and waited for him, and when he got to me he said that Tom had sent my gun back to me. I told him to tell Tom that I had no intention of killing him, and that if he would behave himself I would never have to hurt him. That night I watched Black's saloon, it being full of gamblers, robbers, and thugs. While watching the saloon from the outside, I saw two men walk in and come out in a few minutes. I arrested them, and, searching them, 
I found on the person of each man a quart of whiskey. I escorted the two men to the office of the Justice of the Peace, and sent for the Justice. When he arrived at his office, I made the two men swear under oath where they bought the whiskey, how much they paid for it, and from whom they purchased it. I then got two warrants out for Black, and getting Sheriff Morris to join me, I went back to arrest him. Black learned that we were after him, however, and left the saloon, and tried to make his escape. Several officers joined in the hunt, and we pursued him vigorously. Sheriff Morris and Officer Logan went northeast down the Rock Island track to the depot, while Bill Garrett and I went northwest. Pretty soon I saw a man running on the outer edge of the town, and saw him stop suddenly and lie down. I said to Bill Garrett, That is Black. As we started after him, he got up and ran to a small building nearby. When I had gotten within twenty-five yards of the house, and was facing the door, Black called out and asked if I was Sullivan. And I told him, Yes. Then he asked me if it was the sheriff with me. I told him, No, that it was Bill Garrett. Then I told him to come out of the house and surrender. He said, Sullivan, I will surrender, but do not shoot me nor hurt me. I replied that I would not hurt a hair on his head for the world if he did not make a play. But if you do make a bad break, I added, I will cut you off at your pockets. He gave up quietly, and I took him to the office of the Justice of the Peace, where I could get a light and read the warrant to him. I shackled him then, and carried him on the next train to Texline, where he was lodged in the county jail. He remained there nine days and nights before he gave bond and was released. I met him soon after he gained his freedom, and had a long talk with him. He told me that he dreaded to be arrested by me that night, on account of the fight which we had engaged in the day before his arrest. Black wound up his side of the conversation by saying, Sullivan, after what has happened between us, I shall always give you credit for being an honest officer. My respect for you has caused me to resolve to hereafter lead a different life. I know that I have been violating the law, but I will quit now, and I would like for you to knock out all the indictments which you have secured against me, and I will take oath that I will never sell another drop of whiskey in the state of Texas. I saw the sheriff and district attorney and begged them to let him take the oath. I expected them to do so, but they did not agree with me and persisted in prosecuting him. Black lived in Dalhart for quite a while after I left there and was assassinated by someone who shot him from across the street. The next sheriff, J.N.O. Webb, and his son were alleged to have committed the deed and were tried but acquitted. No one knew for certain who did the shooting. Beckett and his bartender took the oath that Black wanted to take and went to Montana, and I never heard from them again. Chapter 55 Unknown Victim Falls in a Gunfight at Dalhart December 22, 1901 To Officer, Dalhart, Texas Arrest and hold one Tom Mayers for murder as he has no examination and notify Sheriff at Beaver City, O.T. Thomas Mayers and Al Zimmerman left last night to get their money. You can find them at the Rock Island office in the morning at Dalhart. Both of these men are about 28 years of age, and they wear a beard of three weeks' growth, five feet, five inches tall, both wearing caps. Zimmerman, accessory to murder. G. O. Neal, section boss. While in Dalhart, I received the above telegram from Mr. Neal, who was working on the railroad about 40 miles out of the city. The message was handed to me while I was talking to some railroad officials in the depot. I immediately wired Sheriff Morris to come down to Dalhart in the morning, tell him I wanted to see him on business. Fearing that the sheriff was not in text line and could not come down to help me, I deputized a Mr. McCormick to assist me in the case. I told the sheriff and McCormick both to come to a certain house before daylight. Both men arrived at the house the next morning, on time as I had requested and I told them that we would go down to the depot before daybreak, so we would not be seen. I did not want anybody to know that anything was wrong. After reaching the depot, we went upstairs into the cashier's office and concealed ourselves. When the cashier arrived at his office, we told him what we were up there for, and I gave him the names of the two men who were to come for their money. When they present their cards, I told him, I want you to notify me. He assured me that he would, and we lay still and waited for Mayers and his partner to show up. About nine o'clock, the sheriff went downstairs and stayed away quite a while. When he returned, I told him that he ought to stay with us, as the men might discover him hanging around the depot and think something was up and not come in. The sheriff stayed with me then until 11.30 o'clock and left me again. I suppose he grew impatient and thought the men were not coming. 
Soon after the sheriff left, the cashier came to me and informed me that my men were at the window. Motioning McCormick to follow me, I opened the door that led into the hallway. I noticed that there were eight or nine men in the chute that led to the cashier's window. Every time a man looked in my direction, I motioned him to come out. In that manner, I finally got everybody out, except the two men who were next to the window, and I wanted them to stay where they were. They were watching the cashier, and did not look around until I took the man nearest me by surprise, and ordered him to hold his hands up. Here in my command, he whirled around quickly on his heels, and as he did so, I twice again said, Hands up! When he saw McCormick and me with our pistols pointing at him, he ran his right hand down into his vest on the left side, and as he did that, I fired, and so did McCormick. We shot at him, and the firing of our pistols created such a dense smoke in the little chute that we could not tell whether the man had a gun or not, and when we saw he was advancing toward us, we fired again, hitting him twice in the breast. Mayers was in front of him, and Zimmerman happened to be out in the hall, but I didn't know it then, and thought that the man who ran his hand down into his vest and advanced on us was one of them, and McCormick and I both fired at him. McCormick shot three times, and I fired four times. After being mortally shot, the victim of our guns ran out of the chute into the hallway, where he soon died from his wounds. Mayers and Zimmerman both emptied their pistols at me, but only succeeded in hitting the man who had already received his fatal wounds. They shot him in the left ear, in the back, and in the right side. A shot struck Mayers in the chin, cutting the under part of it off. The top of his sleeve was also torn by a stray bullet from Zimmerman's gun. Before the fight was over, the smoke had become so dense in the chute and hallway that we had great difficulty in recognizing each other. During the confusion, McCormick got on the other side of the room and came near shooting me while firing at the man. The man who was killed fell with both feet propped against the facing of the door that led into the cashier's room. I went to him when the smoke cleared away and found at his left side a forty-four cartridge and at his right side a forty-one Colts cartridge that had been snapped, the cap having gone two-thirds of the way in. His pistol had failed to shoot, and the smoke caused me not to see it. I looked around for his gun, but not finding it, I was satisfied that whoever pulled the dead man out of the door had taken it. I stepped back to McCormick and told him that we had better knock the empties out and reload our guns, as we had one more man to catch. When I learned that the wrong man had been killed, however, I knew that we had both the murderers to capture, and McCormick and I soon got busy. Zimmerman and Mayers were running around in a cluster of excited men, but we picked them out and gave chase to Zimmerman, leaving Mayers behind. The sheriff came up about that time, and I secured a horse for him and sent him after Zimmerman, who was trying very hard to make his escape. Then I summoned seventy-five men to help me search for Mayers, who I thought was hiding behind one of the numerous piles of culverts, ties, and rails that were stacked in different places up and down the tracks. Zimmerman was soon caught by the sheriff and brought back to me. A lady saw Zimmerman and Mayers drop two six-shooters in a barrel, and she got the weapons and sent them to me a little while after they were captured. Mayers was found, after a three hours search, in a restaurant, bleeding to death from the wound on his chin, which he had received during the fight. I took him to a doctor and had him treated. Then I wired the sheriff at Beaver City, Oklahoma, that I had his men. He came at once and got them. An inquest was held over the body of the man whom we had killed, and we were exonerated. The grand jury met in June, and they also declared that I was not guilty of murder. They were of the opinion that if the man had not been a fugitive from justice, he would not have tried to pull a gun on me. They further declared that I did what any other officer should have done under the same circumstances. End chapters 51 through 55「Twelve Years in the Saddle for Law and Order on the Frontiers of Texas » by Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, Texas Ranger. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Appendix containing poems and letters to the author. A Last Farewell Composed and written by Dora Brown, October 13, 1902. Just one year ago today, love, we said our last goodbye. We parted in a quarrel. You know the reason why. But that is all forgiven, and I dreamed it o'er and o'er. Little did we think when parting that we'd meet again no more. Yes, it is all forgiven, 
a thousand times and more. Oh, could it once more happen, to be forgiven o'er? But it seems that our paths have parted, that the hope we have cherished must die. Your looks and actions are remembered, even your saying goodbye. The world is full of pleasures, but few, if any, I see, since the one I love so dearly is taken away from me. My prayers are for a brighter day, when we may prove our love, but if we meet no more on earth, I hope we'll meet above. Yes, I had rather share your grief than other people's glee. While you are nothing to the world, you are all the world to me. I once saw sunshine in your smiles, heard music in your tone. I oft recall your words of love when I am all alone. Once you were my betrothed, noble, brave, and true. The love that gleamed in your brown eyes was as gentle as the dew. As fearless as our patriots, who have braved the storms of sea, you have roamed the west all over, with the heart that beat for me. Then you were a gay cowboy, your life was happy and free. There was nothing then to blight your joys, and pleasure was in store for me. We vowed to wed and never part, the wedding day was set. On Christmas night, with hand and heart, our vows we plight to ne'er regret. But cruel fate has on us frowned, my prayers were all in vain. My darling in the sentence found seven long years to remain. At Fowler, in a convict camp, my loved one toils each day, while one at home with bleeding heart for him does watch and pray. The saloon at Dalhart caused this war, the man was not to blame. For in this business we all know, many men are brought to shame. Don't let this hurt your feelings, love, and blame me not, my own dear Ed, for all will be forgotten here when we are numbered with the dead. My motto is, I will be true, my vows will never change. I love none half so well as you, as long as life remains. No other love my heart can wake, no matter where I rove. The promise I shall never break, I am going to prove true to the one I love. Uh, this July 12, 1908. I knew this lady well. She used to live in Hutchinson County, Texas. She composed this poem for Ed while living in Channing, Texas, and sent it to him while he was in the penitentiary. W.J.L. Sullivan. Texas Rangers After the Mob Governor Culberson, from among the rest, chose four rangers whom he thought best. He ordered us to San Saba to put down crime. We met in Goldthwaite all on time. Two from the Panhandle, two from the Rio Grande, which made a jolly little ranger band. We stopped at a hotel to stay all night. From what the people said, we expected a fight. They puffed and blowed and said we were in danger, for a bushwhacker didn't like a ranger. We laughed at such talk and considered it fun, but wherever we went, we carried our gun. We had a six-shooter, a Winchester too, that would shoot a buffalo through and through. Next morning at early dawn, we were off to San Saba, as sure as you're born. In a wagon, with sheet and bows, how we stood it, the good Lord knows. The roads were rough as rough could be. Why it did not kill us, I cannot see. Over mountains and hills, through the dust, over rocks, till I thought, die I must. We stopped in San Saba all that night, still expecting a hard little fight. We rose next morning, gathered up our tricks, our camping outfit we began to fix. We got a pair of mules and a wagon too, cooking utensils and something to chew. We wanted a cook, for we expected to be slain, so the job was given to Buck Chamberlain. We stopped in town a day or two, met some of the girls, as pretty as ever we knew. Then to the Colorado River we soon did go. When to return we did not know. The sheriff went along to pilot us through. He knew the country. Buck did, too. We stopped at noon, got something to eat. For economy, Buck was hard to beat. He got on the wagon, taking a chew, and said, Come on, boys, better go through. He drove into the creek, his lines all slack stalled his mules, and then looked back. Sullivan, Barker, and Edgar Neal all jumped off and grabbed a wheel. Maddox jumped off and grabbed one, too. Buck hit old Jack and yelled, Get up, Sue! We made it to the river and pitched our tent. To have a mess of fish, we were all bent. Still, we were hearing a lot of the mob, but we felt as though we were on to our job. We rode over the country, went where we pleased, but kept our eyes on all the big trees. So we sent to Sheriff Bell for a good watchdog. It would tickle you to death to see him catch a hog. He caught by the tail, dropped down behind. They went over that hill simply flying. Here are the Texas Rangers. I know it is a hard life. 
you had better find a girl and ask her to be your wife. Now, if you trust in God, he will carry you through. So goodbye, Ranger boys. I'll bid you adieu. Composed by Alan Maddox, Company D, Rio Grande. W.J.L. Sullivan, Sergeant, Company B, Panhandle. January 11th, 1897. The Cowboy's Hymn When I think of the last great roundup on the eve of eternity's dawn, I think of the host of the cowboys that have been with us here and have gone. I think of those big-hearted fellows who'll divide with you blanket and bread, with a piece of stray beef well roasted, and charge for it never a red. I wonder if any will greet me, on the sands of that evergreen shore, with a hearty God bless you, old fellow, that you've met with so often before. And I often look upward and wonder if the green fields will seem half so fair, if any the wrong trail have taken, and fail to be over there. The trail that leads down to perdition is paved all the way with good deeds, but in the great roundup of ages, dear boys, this won't answer your needs. The trail to green pastures, though narrow, leads straight to the home in the sky, and Jesus will give you your passport to the land in the sweet by and by. Jesus has taken the contract to deliver all those who believe at the headquarters ranch of the Father, in the great range where none can deceive. The inspector will stand at the gateway, where the herd, one and all, must go by, and the roundup by the angels in judgment must pass neath his all-searching eye. No maverick nor slicks will be tallied in that great book of life in his home, for he knows all the brands and the earmarks that down through all ages have come. But along with the strays and the sleepers, the tailings must turn from the gate. No road brand to give them admission, but that awful sad cry, too late. But I trust in that last great roundup, when the rider shall cut the big herd, that the cowboy will be represented in the earmark and brand of the Lord. To be shipped to that bright mystic region, over there in green pastures to lie, and lead by the crystal still waters to the home in the sweet by and by. Charlie Roberts Huntsville Graveyard there's an upland field near the Huntsville stream where the grass grows rank and tall, a place of dread to cherished hearts when the evening shadows fall. The laugh is hushed, the voice grows mute, it is passed with a quickened tread, that little spot on God's green earth where lies the convict dead. How many lives that have promised fair in boyhood's early prime have found their resting place up there that's marked with those of crime. God grant that in their former days they've done some deeds of love that will balance all their erring ways in the book of life above. And there's many a boy that has gone astray, yes, many a mother's pride, and among the dead are laid away on Huntsville's green hillside. They perhaps are listening for his steps that in death are forever still, and watching for the form that lies in Huntsville's graveyard hill. Composed by A. E. Hillen, Clayton, New Mexico, July 12, 1908. I, W. J. Sullivan, caught this man in Dalhart while stationed there holding down crime. Song Ballad of the Dying Ranger The sun was sinking in the west, and fell with a lingering ray, through the branches of the forest, where the dying ranger lay. Beneath the shade of a palmetto and the silvery sunset sky, far away from his home in Texas, we laid him down to die. A group that gathered around him, his comrades in the fight, the tears rolled down each manly cheek as they bid him a last good night. One friend, a loved companion, was kneeling by his side, striving to quench the lifeblood flow, but, alas, in vain he tried. His heart was filled with anguish when he found it all in vain, as over each loved companion's cheeks the tears rolled down like rain. Up spoke the dying ranger, saying, Weep no more for me. I am crossing over the river, where all beyond is free. Come gather close around me, and listen to what I say. I'm going to tell a story while my spirit hastes away. Far away in loved old Texas, that good old Lone Star State, there is one that will wait my coming. With a weary heart she will wait. A fair young girl, my sister, my only hope and pride. My only care from childhood, I have none else beside. I've nourished and I've cherished her lonesome heart to cheer. She loves, oh, so fondly, and she is to me so dear. When our country was in danger, and called for volunteers, Sister threw her arms around me, and burst it into tears, Saying, Go, my darling brother, drive the engines from our shore, 
My heart shall need your presence, but our country needs you more. My mother, she lies sleeping beneath the churchyard sod, and many a year has passed and gone since her spirit went to God. My father lies perished beneath the dark blue sea. I've no father, I've no mother. There is only Nell in me. I know I love my country. I have given to her my all. And had it not been for my sister, I would be content to fall. I am dying, comrades dying. She will see me never more. But in vain she will wait my coming at the little cottage door. Come gather close around me and listen to my dying prayer. You will be to her a brother and shield her with a brother's care. The rangers spoke together, as one voice seemed to fall. She will be to us a sister. We will guard her, one and all. One short, brief look of anguish over his youthful face was spread. One quick, repulsive shadow, and the ranger boy was dead. On the banks of the old Nueces, we laid him down to rest, with a saddle for a pillow, and a lone star on his breast. July 29, 1897 W. R. Stiles The Old Cowboy of the Plains Written by a mountain buffalo hunter, Jim Williams The day is bleak and cold and drear. Summer is gone and winter is near. The cold blue air upholds no birds, and the cattle drift south in rustling herds. The cowboy's roundup and trail work's done. He hangs up his saddle, his spurs, and his gun. He turns out his ponies on the mesquite grass, and rustles the shippers for a homeward pass. If he can't get a pass, he will rustle the freights until he gets back to his home in the States. He crossed the broad plains way back in 68, when mules and ox wagons hauled all the freight. The California route was a usual trail, and the stagecoach and ponies carried the mail. He would tell tales all winter of the long, long ago, of engines on the prairies, and the herds of buffalo. When you hear him sing, his song's all so sad. You'd think, after all, he's not so bad. It's bury me not in the lone prairie, where the wild coyotes will howl over me, where the wild rose blooms and the wind sports free. Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie. Then again he would laugh and fill with mirth, and tell a bronco that quits the earth, or when he was called out in the dead hour of night to check a stampede or Indians to fight. From Texas to Montana he followed the trail, and to Denver and Cheyenne he expected his mail. None but old cowboy can realize or ever know the dangers and hardships we experienced from South Texas to mountain peaks of snow. Through blinding rain and sunshine, though the days and nights were long, the weeks and months were rolling while he sung his cowboy song. Trail on, dogies, Montana is your home. From the salt grass and cactus to the north plains you must roam. With his saddle for a pillow under his head, the grass of the prairie served him for his bed. Often he watched the bright stars till almost day, thinking of his home and sweetheart so far away. He rejoices when frost falls, and he sees the autumn moon, for his work is about over, and he is going home soon. He said to the boys as he boarded the train, You will never see me on the plains again. This cowboy life is tough and all too sad. I'll buy me a farm and settle down beside my old dad. Just think of the big red apples and my brown eyed Sue and the good times that's coming to me down in old Mizzou. He arrives home for Christmas, or perhaps Thanksgiving Day, when the old folks are happy and the young folks are gay. The girls are all smiling on reckless bronco rider, and are treating him to homemade candy, ginger cakes, and apple cider. While one old couple were pleased, they were saying, Now, daughter Mirandy, we know very well for whom you are making that lasses candy. I wouldn't go to any trouble for him if I were you, for he's desperately in love with your little cousin Sue. So winter after winter the boys drifted home from the west, and each girl in her Lindsay done her level best to corral the wild cowboy and tame him down, and keep him from getting drunk and shooting up the town. These boys seemed restless and loved to chase the longhorn instead of being a nester and plowing the green corn. He took in the theaters, the varieties and dance, and took a sly drink whenever there was a chance. He would seldom go home for his dinner at noon, for he was watching some game in a downtown saloon. And on bologna, cheese, and crackers he would feed, while he told some tenderfoot of a big stampede. His money all spent, he barely escapes jail, and resolves once more to hit the cowboy trail. Many years have passed now, and the old folks are dead. He don't go home winters, but is a line rider instead. So alone in his dugout through the long winter nights he does stay, listening to the wail of the winds 
and the wolves on the hills not far away. Quietly and slowly, he is filling his pipe with long green, and thinking of the trials and hardships he has seen. It's strange he did not save up some of his gains before it was too late, and buy that little farm back in his old native state. For his girl sure loved him, and for him would still be set in baits, if it had not been for a young farmer back in the States. So sadly and slowly he thinks as he smokes, and is wondering who is now telling the Tenderfoot's jokes. He had been a Texas Ranger, and stood for many a year, a target for desperados without a thought of fear. Spring opens at last on the far distant plain, and the line rider comes out in his saddle again. He is dashing and bold, but he is getting quite old, and the story of another cowboy will soon be told. And as he lay on the ground and gazed at the same bright stars in June, he felt that his time was coming soon, to join the old cowboys who had gone before, to the great eternal roundup on the other shore. His life had been wrecked, and he felt that he must soon die, and he wondered if there was a home for the cowboys in the sweet by and by. And if on the other side of Jordan, in the green fields of Eden, where the tree of life is blooming, if there is rest for me. I have rode my last bronco, to the boys he had said, while out on the prairie he made down his bed. Alas, it was too true, for just before dawn, to the great eternal roundup his spirit had gone. Then we dug a shallow grave, just six by three, and buried him out on the lone prairie. J.R. Williams House of Representatives, State of Texas. Whereas Captain W.J.L. Sullivan was elected doorkeeper of the 31st legislature at the beginning of the regular session, and has served in that capacity with distinction, and whereas he has always been on time, and has never been absent from duty during the entire session, and whereas during all the calls of the house he was always courteous, but firm as the rock of Gibraltar, and whereas he has performed all the duties of doorkeeper in a most efficient manner, therefore be it resolved by the House of Representatives that the House extends to him its sincere thanks for so faithfully discharging all of his duties as doorkeeper. Signed, Aston. District Clerk's Office, Tarrant County, W.D. McVean, Clerk, Mike E. Smith, Judge, 17th District, Irby Dunklin, Judge, 48th District, Fort Worth, Texas, January 9, 1902, W.J.L. Sullivan, Esquire, Dalhart, Texas, My Dear Friend, I am in receipt of your letter of recent date telling me of the unfortunate occurrence which resulted in the death of a man at your hands and your attempt to make an arrest of another. I had also read of the affair in the newspapers, and was much grieved to learn of it, both on your account as well as on account of the one who was killed. I have known you well ever since I was a child, and feel assured beyond the possibility of a doubt that the killing was an honest mistake on your part. I have never heard you charged of doing any living person a willful wrong, and knowing your noble, generous nature as I do, I know you are incapable of such an act. Your brave, honest nature would not permit you to take even an unfair advantage of an enemy in a conflict much less to willfully kill an innocent man whom you did not know and against whom you had no grievance. While the affair was most unfortunate and deeply to be deplored, I have no doubt but that any officer in your position at the time, and viewing the surroundings as, as you did, would have done likewise. I consider the whole occurrence more as an accident, or as the result of accidental circumstances, than otherwise, and I sincerely sympathize with you in your deep regrets over it all. No one who knows and believes in you, as I do, will censor you under all the circumstances. Your friend sincerely, Irby Dunklin. Last letter written by a condemned man. On October 27, 1899, Reverend G. E. Morrison was hanged in Vernon for the murder of his wife in Panhandle City in the spring of that year. This was one of the most celebrated and remarkable murders, trials, and executions that has ever occurred in Texas, and attracted more attention, perhaps, in the state and Indian territory than any case for many years, owing to the character and profession of the man. Captain John L. Sullivan, now of the Capitol Police Force, assisted in the execution of Morrison at Vernon, October 27, 1899. On the night previous, Captain Sullivan, who was on the death watch, requested the condemned man to write him a note that he might preserve it as a remembrance. He indicted the following letter, which has never before been published, the original of which Captain Sullivan has in his possession. Vernon, Texas, October 26, 1899. Mr. Sullivan. Dear Sir, You have asked me to write something that you can keep to remember the occasion of our meeting. 
I don't know what to say to you, but I hope the following may be entirely satisfactory. First, I believe in a future life, and I believe that men are punished for the sins of this life and are rewarded for the good things. Second, I believe in a general judgment and all must stand in that day before the bar of God and be judged. I believe I have the witness of God's Spirit bearing witness with my own spirit, and believe that, though God allows man's law to take my life, yet he saves me, and I have no fears of the future whatever. Now, goodbye, and may you ever be the champion of the right and an enemy of the wrong. Your well-wisher, G. E. Morrison. A Tribute of Honor Aberdeen, Texas, August 18, 1893 At a meeting of our citizens today, the following resolutions were adopted. Whereas, on or about April 1, 1893, Corporal W. J. L. Sullivan, of Company B, Texas State Rangers, established headquarters in our midst to investigate charges of cattle stealing and other lawlessness preferred by certain private individuals, whose object in calling on the state for rangers we believe to have been the intimidation of settlers. And, whereas, Corporal Sullivan, upon coming here, had a one-sided story and the prejudice of our people against him, and might very easily have precipitated much trouble, but by his cool-headed, careful, and thorough investigation, conducted in a gentlemanly manner, he succeeded in tracing these false accusations against our community to their source, and by his diplomacy averted trouble. And, whereas, Corporal Sullivan has been recalled, now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the undersigned citizens of Aberdeen, desire to thank Corporal Sullivan for his manly treatment of us all, and for his valuable services to our community while located here, and be it resolved that we recommend Corporal Sullivan to his superior officer as an officer we believe to be possessed of the necessary nerve and ability to perform the most difficult task in his line, and one well calculated to make the Ranger Force respected and popular among the people, and be it further resolved that these resolutions be sent to Corporal Sullivan, and that a copy of the same be furnished the following papers for publication, Fort Worth Gazette, Canna Chief, Amarillo Northwest, and Memphis Herald. E. E. McAllister, Alan Dillard, W. A. Dethridge, J. G. Wright, J. R. Hill, S. L. Blake, S. F. Booker, J. A. McCracken, T. E. Walker, J. H. White, T. O. Jones, Bob Brown, J. N. Jones, D. A. Goodwin, M. C. Starkey, Andy Jones, William Wall, J. W. Ammons, S. E. Tomlinson, J. C. Walker, T. E. Walker, T. B. Starkey, William Jones, A. L. Walker, W. E. Johnson, W. P. Bumpass. I hewed to the line and let the chips fall where they may and won the victory. Thank God my motto is do right and go ahead. W. J. L. Sullivan, ex-sergeant of Company B, Texas Rangers. Copied August 23, 1906 by G. C. Morris. Austin, Texas, August 1, 1906. Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, City. My dear fellow, I am glad to bear testimony to the brave and faithful service you rendered your state as a Texas Ranger during a long series of years of arduous duties. I know you love Texas far more than thousands who have proclaimed their patriotism from political platforms. I have not forgotten the dark days of ten to twenty years ago when, in many localities, the presence of the Texas Rangers was the only thing that gave hope of protection of life and property. The years of awful dread that hung over the counties bordering on the Colorado River from Milburn to Bluffton, which saw the first rift in the lowering clouds of mob rule when you and your little band of rangers struck camp in the very heart of the mob country, and by fearless vigilance, absolutely untiring, day and night, at last brought assurance of law and order to that terror-stricken community. It was my privilege to see much of you in that dangerous position and undertaking, and my pleasure to know that the courage, tact, and skill displayed by you under many trying conditions met with the praise of all fair-minded citizens. And, too, I was a distressed onlooker and interested with painful regret the unfortunate accident that befell you one cold December day in 1896, resulting from your extreme desire to lend every aid to the county authorities in ferreting out crime. The sheriff rushed up to you, saying, John L., let one of your boys go after Del Dean, a horse thief, who has just left town. He was indicted by the grand jury. There were none of your boys in hailing distance, so you said, what's the matter with me, and was now chasing that coyote through the mountain break south of the town, where old Sorrel made an airship of you and your ordinance of dynamite shells in an unannounced rehearsal of a high somersaulting performance, I suppose, 
although I had not noticed any bill posters about town that day. During the rehearsal you went on a strike, two strikes in fact, one for high air and then for a soft spot to alight, which was about a solid acre of honeycomb limestone, where the Citizens Committee of Lawyers and Doctors spent several hours, tenderly, and with suppressed curses, gathering up the fragments and carting them to town. There were no rocks left on that acre. You and the dynamite cartridges had not done a thing to them. I think you still carry a souvenir of that performance somewhere about your right wrist. You merit the gratitude of every friend of law and order by your long, courageous, faithful service as a Texas Ranger of the true type, ever ready, never tiring, and always civil, courteous, and sober. Texas never had a more zealous and fearless ranger in her service is the way I size you up, and this is endorsed by hundreds of men scattered from here to the lonely dugout in the Indian Territory, where Beckham passed in his cheeks one bitter cold night when old John L., far in the van, grew impatient for the others to arrive and charged the outlaws. You carry a broken rib, I believe, as a memento of that little fracas. Your friend, Sidon Harris. Turner and Boyce, Lawyers. Amarillo, Texas, December 26, 1904. To the members-elect of the 29th Legislature, it has just come to my knowledge that Mr. W. J. L. Sullivan, late of Company B, Frontier Battalion of Texas, will be an applicant for the position of doorkeeper of the House of Representatives, and, as a citizen of Texas who feels a deep interest in securing the very best material to fill the various places of public trust, I wish to add my testimony to the deserving worth of Mr. Sullivan. I have known Mr. Sullivan for over fifteen years, during a large portion of which time he was stationed in Amarillo as one of the rangers of Company B, and, if my memory is not at fault, he was for some time first sergeant of that company here. He has always been one of the most zealous and faithful officers it has ever been my pleasure to know. He was always unflinching in his high regard for and devotion to duty. It is his nature to be passionately loyal to the enforcement of the laws, and so well known is his courage and fidelity to duty that his name has long been a constant terror to evildoers. His fearlessness in the face of danger, and his sterling integrity was, during his stay with us, a reassuring safeguard of our protection against violators of the law. No matter how desperate the criminal whose capture was desired, nor how many hardships were to be endured in his pursuit, there was never the slightest degree of hesitancy on the part of Mr. Sullivan, or John L., as he is familiarly known. He was always ready and anxious to do his whole duty, and his valuable services have been highly beneficial to the panhandle. Besides being a splendid officer, Mr. Sullivan is a sober, honorable, and reliable man. He stands high among the people who know him best, and he has many friends throughout this section who feel that his long and faithful services to the state, the many hardships which he endured, and the example which he set for the public good, ought to be rewarded now with the position which he seeks. Very truly yours, Thomas F. Turner. San Saba, Texas January 25, 1902. To the Grand Jury of Dallam County, Texas, at their next regular session in and for said county, I have learned with regret of the trouble my old friend, John L. Sullivan, has had recently in your county in trying to arrest two murderers, which he has been notified and requested to do, and, knowing John L. as I do, and feeling the interest in him and his welfare that I do, and having good reasons for it that I have, I hope you will excuse me for writing on the subject, which is not done to try and influence you corruptly or wrongfully, but that you consider his character and disposition, along with the actions you may deem necessary to investigate and take action on, in connection with the unfortunate affair John L. got into, and that you may do your duty and act justly in the matter. I have known Mr. Sullivan for the last ten or twelve years as an officer and law-abiding citizen, and state ranger as a man that is always ready to try to do his duty fearlessly. I was district attorney in the 46th Judicial District of Texas under G. A. Brown, the district judge, and in some of the counties in my district I had some just such characters to deal with in my prosecutions as those murderers Sullivan ran onto in your country, and they would form clans to try to intimidate and deter me from prosecuting them vigorously, and my district judge often deemed it necessary to call on the governor for state rangers to come to the courts for my protection and safety. John L. Sullivan was always sent as sergeant of a squad of rangers to protect me and preserve order in the court, and John L. always accomplished the purpose for which he was sent, and did it wisely and fearlessly, and proved himself one of the best and most cautious, as well as determined, officers I ever saw or knew. 
He has come in contact with such daring, desperate characters so often, and knows their place so well, that he can't afford to wait when he sees a criminal make an obstinate play when he is trying to arrest him, and the question in this case, as it seems, was whether he should wait and delay his opportunity until him or his assistant, or both, were shot down by the outlaws, or whether, as a good officer, he should do his duty at once, and out of the abundance of caution beat his desired prisoner's shooting, when the first intimation of the outlaws indicated their purpose, and in the furor and excitement, and so many shooting on both sides, one to enforce the majesty of the law and the other to resist it, it is hard to tell whose bullets did the killing. All good citizens should uphold the majesty of the law and the officers of the law in the discharge of their duty. I am not dictating to you, gentlemen, but I do not want you to be deceived in the character of Mr. Sullivan. Begging your pardon for troubling you this much, I am truly yours for justice and right, be that in favor or against my old friend. Signed, G. W. Walters, Attorney at Law. Dalhart, Texas, January 12, 1903. To whom it may concern, I take pleasure in pleading the cause of my old friend, John L. Sullivan. I have known him long, and know him to be a brave, good man, and a Christian gentleman. Long he has served in western Texas. He has spent the best part of his life in its service, always ready to defend the right and fight the wrong. I have seen, in new western towns, even right here in Dalhart, in its infancy, robberies and lawlessness of all kinds committed daily. John L. Sullivan came, and it was like a calm before a mighty storm, wrestling with unseen danger. But he was there, calm and immovable, brave as a lion, ready to do his duty and serve his people. And now, dear friends, I think he deserves something at the hands of the people he has served so long and faithfully. Long live my old friend and his name long after he is gone. Honor to whom honor is due has always been my motto. There is no man in western Texas more deserving than John L. Sullivan, the faithful discharger of duty. Signed, respectfully, Mrs. M. S. Jackson. Flack and Dalrymple, Attorneys at Law, Lano, Texas, July 29, 1907. To Governor George Curry, Santa Fe, New Mexico. My dear sir, I take great pleasure in recommending to your most favorable consideration my old friend, Captain W. J. L. Sullivan. I understand he will be an applicant for a captaincy of mounted police under your administration. If so, you can find no better man for the position. I have known him as an officer for the past twenty-five years, and when I say he has at all times done his full duty, I speak only the truth, and when it can be said of a man that he has faithfully discharged his duty, no more need be said, for in that sentence is contained sufficient to a businessman like yourself. However, I will further say that Captain Sullivan has been with the Texas Ranger Force for the past twelve years, and in that capacity he has been called to the aid of our peace officers from one end of our state to the other. His field of action has been mostly confined to West Texas, where he has had to contend with all character of violators of the law, from the midnight assassin to the petty thief, but his best work has been done in dealing with what is known in central West Texas as the mob. And I speak of this because his work in that line came under my direct observation. In ridding that portion of our state of the mob, Texas owes Captain Sullivan a debt of gratitude she can never pay. He is a man of great executive ability, nature having done much for him in that way, cool, calm, and deliberate in action, and in whose makeup the word fear has no abiding place in any fiber of his existence. During his long career as an officer, he has been called to face danger in its every form, and he has yet to show the white feather, for he has never done so up to this hour. Having been brought frequently face to face with the very worst element of the West Texas desperado, he has never come in contact with a sufficient number to check him from his duty. He has courage without rashness, and his experience as an officer would aid him greatly in dealing with the character of men you want controlled. He knows them as few men know them, he knows the best method of dealing with them, and I am sure he would make you a valuable man anywhere you may place him. My dear sir, in writing you as I have, in behalf of Captain Sullivan, I have not indulged in fulsome praise, but simply speak truthful words which came direct from my heart. I have not gone into detail, because I know your time is too valuable to be thus consumed. Myself, in common with the host of Captain Sullivan's friends out west, would be much pleased if you could find it consistent with your duty to give him a place under your administration. He is worthy of it, and I feel sure you would never have cause to regret it. 
Captain Sullivan's personal integrity is above reproach, and his courage is unsurpassed. Hoping your administration will prove a blessing to your people, and with best regards, I am, yours very respectfully, signed, Jason Flack, ex-member, Texas Legislature, not 30th. Dalhart, Texas, January 8, 1903. To whom it may concern, I am very much pleased to write this letter in behalf of our much appreciated friend, Mr. John L. Sullivan. If, perchance, it may through some divine power or influence find its way to a deserving community who needs and is able to pay for the services of a faithful, much-deserving officer and Christian gentleman, which we Dalhart people have found in the person of Mr. Sullivan. His presence in our midst is like a ray of sunshine in time of storm, both as a firm, kind-spoken officer, whom he thinks would feel sadly disgraced should he for a moment shrink from his duty or betray any trust reposed in him, and a friendly Christian visitor. We regret very much to lose him from our little town, which he served so faithfully. His memory, I dare say, will be like letters of gold and pictures of silver when we think of the reformation wrought by his services, and wherever he may go, we bid him Godspeed. Signed, very truly, Mrs. S. Hoffman. Douglasville, Texas, February 13, 1908. Governor George Curry, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Dear Sir, I am now about to engage in a duty that we owe to each other, our fellow man. I am now recommending to you a friend, a man that I know to be true to his country and true to his fellow man in every sense of the word. The man that I present to you is the Honorable W. J. L. Sullivan. I have known him for forty years. He is an honorable, truthful, sober Christian gentleman as ever lived, and if you can help Mr. Sullivan, I will appreciate the favor, as he has many friends in this country that will consider it a great favor. Yours truly, signed, W. B. Heath, Justice of the Peace, Cass County, Texas. Douglasville, Texas, February 9, 1908. Governor George Curry, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Dear Sir, the gentleman who presents this to you is Captain W. J. L. Sullivan, a citizen of this place who visits your city on personal business, and any courtesy shown him will be gratefully appreciated by his many friends throughout Texas. For many years he has served our state as one of the rangers, and in other responsible ways, and has always been true to every trust and faithful and honest to every friend, and a terror to evildoers. Hence it is, I take pleasure in handing you this endorsement of an honest man. Respectfully yours, signed, W. D. Stone. Douglasville, Texas, February 14, 1908. Governor George Curry, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Dear Sir, I take this occasion to introduce to you the bearer of this letter, Mr. W. J. L. Sullivan, whom I have known personally for forty years. Mr. Sullivan is generous, honorable, and, in fact, one of nature's noblemen. He served in the capacity of state ranger for twelve years, with great credit to himself and an honor to the state of Texas. Mr. Sullivan visits your state on private business. Any advice and assistance you may render will be highly appreciated by him and duly acknowledged by myself. Believing that your acquaintance will be mutual and agreeable, I am, very respectfully, signed, T.G. Howe, M.D. February 5th, 1908. Governor George Curry, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Dear Sir, this will introduce to your favorable acquaintance my friend, Mr. W. J. L. Sullivan, whom I have favorably known for more than 35 years. Mr. Sullivan has been an officer as state ranger for 12 years, in which position he rendered efficient and a valuable service to our state. I can truthfully say that Mr. Sullivan is a truthful, reliable, sober gentleman, and stands preeminently high with all Texans as an officer and public servant. My friend, Sullivan, visits your state on private business of his own. Anything that you can do for him, or favors rendered, will be highly appreciated by the writer. Very respectfully, signed, A. C. Smith. Douglasville, Texas, February 13, 1908. Governor George Curry, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Dear Sir, this will be handed to you by my friend, Mr. W. J. L. Sullivan, whom I have known from his boyhood, and cheerfully recommend him to the favorable consideration and confidence of the public. Any favor shown him will be duly appreciated by his many friends in Cass County, Texas. Yours respectfully, signed, A. C. Oliver, M.D. The Ex-Ranger Recovering 
a brave and fearless man who has taken many risks. Ex-Ranger Sergeant W. J. L. Sullivan, better known as John L., is rapidly improving from the recent accident which occurred at his ranch north of town some two months ago. As a full account was given in these columns at the time, it is not necessary to refer to it again. Sullivan's first experience as a ranger was in 1888 under Captain McMurray, who was then commanding Company B of the State Ranger Force. Since that time, Sullivan has been a terror to the lawbreakers of the state and has succeeded in running down more criminals than any other ranger ever in the service before or since. Eminently possessed of those sturdy qualities which go to make up a successful executive officer, Sullivan has justly earned a distinction as broad as that state which he so faithfully served. Quiet, cool, and always sober, he stood when in the service without a peer in the state as an executive officer. He made some enemies, it is true, but so has every other officer who has discharged his duty as honestly and as fearlessly as he did. It is not necessary to enumerate numerous scouts and various expeditions led and the important captures made, as they are a part of the criminal annals of our state. Wish you an immediate recovery, John L., and may you live many years to rest on the laurels you have so justly won. Amarillo, Northwest. End of Twelve Years in the Saddle.